The pricing game can be a tough one in general. And pricing a book is among some of those tough decisions authors are positioned to make. But it doesn't have to be. There can and should be a method to this pricing madness. <laughs> Most authors ask themselves the age-old question, is it too high or is it too low? Well, when I was thinking about that question, I found myself asking a different question. How low can you go? Do you remember that game, Limbo? <laughs> And then I was reminded that that was a question when playing that game Limbo, not book pricing. And it's not about how low you can go. It's more about how high can the market bear. Jennifer Crosswhite, who happens to be a dear friend of mine and a book coach and editor, and I host a weekly LinkedIn Live, and we talked recently about this specific topic. And I wanted to share it with you. As you listen, there are two questions I want you to think about as it pertains to you and your book. The first one is, what do you want to make on your book? My second question is, what will someone pay for it? Now we talk about ways to determine this and empower you with the information you need to price your book correctly in a way that works in your favor. Every Wednesday, Jen and I answer author questions like this one during our usual LinkedIn live, which is scheduled at 1130 AM Eastern. And I'm excited to invite you into this chat, but I also wanted to invite you to our Wednesday LinkedIn lives. You're always welcome. Find me on LinkedIn and you will see the upcoming one that you can sign up for. What can happen when a book coach and a book marketer come together for a virtual chat with a cup of caffeine? <laughs> Anything in this season, that's what we're doing is sharing with you some of my favorite topics that Jen and I have discussed. And today it happens to be about pricing. So grab a mug. We love talking about our coffee mugs and your choice of caffeine. Mine is usually chai tea. And join us for this meaningful chat. Let's roll. Hey, I'm Stephanie Fager and Empower is my middle name. Okay, you got me? Not really, but I think it should be. I believe that empowered people empower people, and I'm obsessed with empowering you, the nonfiction author, with impactful marketing strategies to help you take your important message and share it with those who desperately need it, want it, and will buy it. As the owner and chief strategist of the Empower PR Group and the author of two books myself, I have merged my love for reading books, writing books, and marketing books to help nonfiction authors with laser-focused strategies and tactics to write books that sell, promote books to those who need and want them most, and build meaningful businesses from empowering messages. Think of this as your one-stop shop for marketing insights from an author who has been there, who has done that, and understands exactly where you are. So get your pens ready because Jen and I are ready to empower you. This is the Empowered Author Podcast. Hello, hello. Hi, Jen. It's Wednesday at 11.30. It's Wednesday. And 8.30 Pacific. So yes, it's time for Beyond the Page. Yay. Oh, One of my favorite parts of the week. I love it. I know. And you know, I was thinking about that this morning as I was thinking about our chat today. And I realized other things in life, like I will rearrange if need be, right? You know, I'm out of town. I can't do that. Um, I'm traveling, you know, whatever. And yet outside of when my grandmother was passing, uh, I mean, I brought you with me. We went to Gatlinburg. We've gone to Nashville That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because I enjoy it so much. I have so yes. much fun doing this with you and chatting with you and um, talking about all things that authors need and don't know that they need or have asked right. us and we want yes. to unpack it. So yeah. anyways, I'm really pumped to be here today. And I'm also really pumped because I have a new mug I have to show you. Okay. Can't wait to see. <laughs> Ready? You ready? Yeah. So I went last week, I went a whole week with no caffeine. Remember, I think I had water in my Yes. Yeah. This week, I think I've had like two teas counting today. So we'll take it. But mm. over the weekend, was last week in Mother's Day? Hold on. No, two, two weekends ago. Two, two weeks ago. During Mother's Day, my kids took me on a, um, on a experiential day because that's what we do Aww. for their birthdays. Yes, and so I didn't fun. have any inclination of what we were doing, but we went to one of my favorite restaurants and there was a big wait. So mm. we, um, it was connected to a place it's called Louisville stoneware. So if you come to Louisville, mm. we should do this. Together. Yes. But it yes. is a place that makes pottery and they, and we, we made three mugs. We made one for me or they made one for me. Um, 
one of my other kids made one for my mother-in-law and then I made one for my mom. Of course, the funny part is, is the handle fell off on the one that I made for my mom. <laughs> so anyway, this is my mug today. My kids. Oh, look at that. I love that. Happy faces. These are flowers. Oh, that's so uh, awesome. So, I know, and the inside's even colored. Oh, <laughs> Green, that's the something. best. I know. And I said, every year now, I want a different mug and we'll be able to see their artistic yes. over time. Oh, how fun. When my kids were little, we did um, just, you could get just the plain white mugs and do the paint pens that you baked in the yes. oven. And so they did that for their grandparents one year, you know, and they were very young, like, you know, two and five or something like that. So a lot of them are kind of scribbles, but my dad is famous for hating coffee. And so they wrote on his mug, no coffee. Oh <laughs> he my still gosh. has it. I was going to say, does they're it covered. Still? Yes. That yes. is awesome. Yeah. Oh, Jen, that is so cute. That is so cute. It is cute. very, very cute. So that's yeah, what I, I just have. Uh, I just have a regular little, you know, it's just a fun, plain it's mug today. One. Nothing super exciting. It's huge because I needed a lot of coffee today. I'm on my second cup. <laughs> it looks like one that you can actually put or make soup in. You could put soup, you know, or it would be good for a chai, you know, all that kind of good yeah. stuff. Yes, it's a nice size. Although yeah. it's pretty warm here today, so I'm kind of like, I might have to switch to something cold. <laughs> it's getting a little warm. What is it where you're at? What is it? like? In I the think it's going to be um, upper 80s up here. Yeah, when I go, I go down into the valley today, and it'll probably be in the 90s. So oh we're up at 3,000 feet, so we are usually about 10 degrees cooler than in the valley. Um, but we're getting into that time of year where it's, it's definitely warm out. So, oh my goodness, I don't know, you know, I don't leave the house often, <laughs> I'm like a little right. bit, me neither. I'm usually working on the computer, so I never know. Right. And I always dress because I'm always cold and you know, yeah. they keep the air on. But uh, my husband shared today that this afternoon and this evening where I live, there's supposed to be some pretty crazy weather coming. So like tornado oh, stuff. And yes. just recently, a couple weeks ago, that there was a tornado that came through and it hit my mom's neighborhood. Literally, you could stand at the entrance of her neighborhood and she's probably, I don't know, 200 feet from it. And you could see this massive house that, the, that half of it was demolished. So literally... We're lucky. So now I'm a little nervous. I don't miss that. I don't miss that about living in the Midwest. I will take earthquakes any day over tornadoes. Really? Any day. Oh, totally. I've never been damaged or had any issues. I don't know if I've even had maybe a broken glass or something from an earthquake. You I don't know. But really, <laughs> so minor. I mean, yeah. the places where they hit, you know, that there are definitely, there's definitely been some issue. I'm not saying that there haven't been, but tornadoes right. cause right. far more damage. Right. Um, right. You know, you don't have to, I mean, of course, we don't really know an earthquake coming, but, um, right. you know, we've had some big ones, the big one that, um, the last big one that was here several years ago, probably three years ago, um, I was, I had my standing desk up and you could, the whole thing was just like swaying back and forth. us like this. I'm like, oh, we're having an earthquake. Okay. And is it pretty frequent for you? Like, does that happen? Like, not really. I mean, we've lived through, you know, my life, we've lived through some big ones. Um, I remember being in, in college and literally in a classroom and feeling the floor go like this, you know, um, and the, it was a whole wall of windows and you, they were just, you usually hear them first because the windows and the light fixtures start rattling before you feel it or the cats actually, the cats usually kind of freak out a little bit. I've never really sustained any damage. Mm. So, unlike the first time I moved to the Midwest, we moved in June and in August, a tornado hit within an, uh, less than a mile from our house. School was canceled. I mean, we had no basement in the house we were in. So we were living, we were all sort of huddled in the bathroom with our 120 pound black lab and no, no electricity, right? So it's hot and muggy and no way to know what's going on. And oh my gosh. <laughs> not my idea of fun. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, you know, so I've lived in the Ohio Valley my whole life and it wasn't until the tornado that was a couple, and I say it was a couple weeks ago. I think it actually was a month or so ago. It was, I was coming home from the hospital when my grandmother was um, in the hospital yeah. in palliative care. And my husband calls me and says, you better hurry up and come home. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like eight or nine o'clock at night. And I said, okay, I'm coming. And I said, wait, my cousin says that there's like some bad weather. Maybe I should just stick it out at the hospital. And he goes, no, if you come now, you'll be fine. And I was literally chased 
by the tornado oh. stint. I've, this is never like the, I, I was like questioning stopping on the side of the road to bang on someone's door to go into their home. My husband, yeah. and we live in the farm and my husband's like, there's no one. I'm like, well, there are people. And he's like, yes, yeah, I mean, they probably are already in their basement. Like it's right. not a neighborhood. Like you have to keep driving. And I found out later, yeah. um, I was 10 minutes ahead of the tornado that touched down off, um, close to the expressway. So like I literally drove mm. in about a way 10 minutes. I would have been in the middle of it. Sirens were going off. My phone was blaring. I'm right. in tears. And then I get home. I'm like, we got to go to the basement. And I get home. This is, um, there was a meme that was circling, which is funny. It's true about Southern people. Maybe it's true for everybody, but there was a meme. It's like, you know, you're in Kentucky in tornado season when everyone's in the basement, except the husband and the kids and they're out front <laughs> watching. It was true. I pulled into my, my driveway and I'm like talking to Corey panicking. And he's like, Hey, and I'm like, my kids are running around the front yard. I'm like, this is not okay, dude. Um, so oh yeah, that gosh. was really scary. I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> no, we we were driving from Michigan to California to move back. Um, we got chased by a tornado in Omaha, Nebraska. And I don't know where I am. You know, we are on a, on a highway and all of our phones in the car are going off and we're listening, you know, I've someone get on a local find a local radio station figure out where the heck we are literally and and you know how it pours rain a lot of times so the rain's yep. coming down oh, yeah. it's hailing we can't see anything i see a yep. walmart i'm like we're getting off here we the walmart parking lots flooded and we mm -hmm. and we have cats right we have to leave the cats in the car in their carrier i'm like okay lord just protect the cats make sure the car everything mm -hmm. we own practically is in the car and we run into Walmart with everybody else in the bathroom. We're all hiding in the, and we're soaking wet at this point, hiding in the bathroom in Walmart till you get the all clear to, to leave. And uh, I was like, yeah, that was, that yeah, was I'm not doing it again. I don't want to do that again. Do that again. <laughs> hey, I'm just curious. We've got some people that are watching. Um, anyone that is watching live or later, I, we want to, I want to know, have you had a you know, traumatic <laughs> tornado or or, or I was going to say hurricane, we could add a hurricane or earthquake experience. Natural disaster. And this Gin. is the kind of thing yeah. that yeah. feeds your writing too, right? I mean, yeah. you take those emotions, you take those, even if you don't use the exact experience. Yeah. Um, I, because I grew up in Southern California and wildfires are a part of life. Those show yeah. up in my books. You put all of that in there. So I would say when you have those experiences, think about those feelings and how you can put them into your writing. It's a really great way to really bring the emotions to life on the page and so don't uh, don't waste those experiences if you have to go through it you might as well use them for good on your stories right think of some of the best writing that you have read some of the best books and usually it's people who have been in the depths of experiencing something what maybe even something semi-related to um to what they're writing about actually the book i want to highlight later connected to that but I also was going to make a joke and say we should we should capture all these stories and create an, an uh, anthology around right yes around, um, disaster yes. experiences across disaster. the world well today we are not here to talk about any of that but I always love chatting too yes. we are here to talk about pricing yes pricing. very important I just have the so. I've got the I've got the morning little sunlight sparkles coming through the Beautiful. blind, you know, so I, I look like I'm being graced by sunlight. You're glowing. You're glowing. <laughs> um, yes, I just literally had this pricing conversation with a client the other day, and it's so important to think about where you are in your writing journey, your career, what your goals are. Uh, what you might do for a beginning writer with a debut book would be a lot different than what you do with an established writer. And so those are all things to consider when you're thinking about where you want to price your book. And we're also talking ebook different than print. Obviously, those are different. And yeah. what you might want to do with that. So those are that's a great discussion to have. It is. And, I, and as with most things related to the book publishing and marketing and writing journey, there's not a right, wrong or indifferent. It's unique right. to your custom needs. There's also so much more and so many more layers to the process, yes. which is why you and I hop on weekly and talk about these topics because yep. at experience firsthand, you got, you and I have learned, but in collaborating and helping other authors, these are, these are not things you should take for granted. Oh, I'll just put it up for 12 bucks or Oh, right. $20, right? Like there is a, a strategy around that. 
and I have three kind of points that I think would be make sense for us to touch on. Of course, just yes. add and build build from it. But let's say you have a book written and it's you're ready to publish it. Now, keep in mind a couple things. Number one, book price can also be dictated by your book length. Uh, yes. And also by if your book is in color or black and white in the interior. Right. If you're self-publishing, these are things you want to think about. If you are leveraging a publisher, they will obviously be on hand to help you. But I know in, if you leverage KDP, for instance, based on their specific requirements to actually manufacture the book, yes, it will be cost. a minimum. Right. Yeah. But you want absolutely. to take a look and realize like, what is, what are the margins and what are your yeah. royalties? And, and one way, Jen, that I usually encourage people to, to begin is look at your competition. Like who out yes, there is. Absolutely. Out, right. Yes. That'll let you, you need know to be, hmm? yeah, you need to be there. If you are too high, people are going to dismiss you. If you are too yep. low, they may not take you seriously. So it's really important to try to be in that sweet spot where your competition is. That's a great place to start. Um, and then you might think about doing some price specials or some things like that for different times, things you want to do, marketing or launches or things like that. But definitely start thinking about your base price, what your competition yep. is doing. Yeah. I mean, I I think looking at competition is just good for everything. It's good for you to look at your competition for covers and even uncovering keywords that might be within their uh, Amazon descriptions, right? That helps yes. you with doing some searches yes. because they are, it's like beta, beta data for it. Beta yes. data. It's data I like it. for you to be able to mine. <laughs> yes. And if you, and when you're looking at your competition, I also want you to not just search and find a book that's similar to yours, maybe in the same category or space, but evaluate how many reviews do they have and how many stars have they gotten. That will right. also let you know, you might there's so much information that can be found in reviews. There's so much there for you to uncover. And it will also let you know what the market will bear. I think that there is definitely something that you should, you know, reflect upon is what do you want to make, but what will someone, um, what will someone pay for? <laughs> right. And, and also think about that if, when you go to buy a book. So, I mean, Jen, I don't know about you. This is kind of silly as a marketer. I know how this works. It's silly. To right. Like, Right. But if you put a book up for $15, I am less likely to buy it than if you put it up for $14.95. That is a it, there's, strategy. There, yes, there is a psychology of pricing. And I listened to someone one time talk about this, and, and I'm sure you can Google and find it. But there's some the way we look at numbers, yeah. we have certain emotional attachments to different numbers. Why does seven work better than six? It has to do literally with how the number faces on the page and our psychology around that. It's really, really fascinating. Um, you might sell more books at $7.99 than $6.99. Mm -hmm. Weirdly enough, you might. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's just a weird, there's some weird psychology around how we look at numbers. And there's a certain reason why, I mean, if you walk through Walmart or Costco and you notice how they have things priced, there's yeah. certain pricing that look odd right? They're like 267, you know, oh, that might mean that it's a discounted price. It's not a normal price. So we get yep. trained to look at odd numbers in certain ways, just by our normal shopping experiences. So mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to stand out? Yep. Yes or no. Right. There's times you might want to do that. Um, there's times it might just make you look like, wow, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so, right. you know, you have to think right. about that for sure. Right. And I, um, I, I don't know also if your brain works this way, but I think in like $5 increment chunks right. and probably that's how other people are searching as well. So for instance, yeah. if you want, if you are pricing your book at 22, $23, just know the people who would have paid 20 will likely not go up two or $3. Like it's just, yeah. it's the psychology, but the people who would be willing to invest 25, well, that's a bargain. Um, right. So you want to think too about your target reader and what yes. will they, what will, what is a no brainer value price where you yes. benefit and they benefit. Right. Um, That's so true. It, yeah. It's, I think it also, you know, outside of, you know, uh, what I love about KDP is that there's a calculator you can play around with on the back end yes. and figure mm -hmm. out what's your margin and what have you. But outside of how many pages are in your book, 
uh, outside of if it's color or not or hardback or whatever. I also want you to consider what are you giving in the book? Is it, yes. you know, so for instance, I think a memoir doesn't provide the opportunity for as, as high of a cost unless you are like a yeah. high well-known um, person right. as a business book will, right? Because people yes. are more likely to invest $25 in a business book that maybe no more than like, you know, my book, my memoir is 1695 on purpose. Side note, Jen, my workbook is also 1695. And I went on <laughs> Amazon today. Uh, this is a good yeah. tip for people to think. Went on Amazon today while I was um, on a client call and was using my book as an example. And yeah. Amazon discounted my book $10 right oh. now. This is the other thing. This is a good thing. When, Am when yes. you go to Amazon and your book is discounted, you as the author are not losing money. Amazon is nope. taking a cut from their side because yep. there is a reason. Maybe there's some yeah. search searching going on around the topic, whatever. So, so for instance, right now, my workbook is $6.95 or something like that, which normally it's $16.95. That's exciting. And it gives That's me something great. to be able to to market. Yeah. I'll be posting yeah. about that on Facebook and social media and LinkedIn. Wouldn't today. it be uh, nice if they let you know when they do that? Yeah, they don't. <laughs> I they know don't. you have to just stumble across it. It's very frustrating. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe that's, um, you know, you and I've been doing a lot of conversations around, um, around productivity and business support and what have you, maybe part of your weekly drum beat for, as an author should be like every Monday, take a look at your Amazon account, look at reviews and take a peek on to see if they've given you a discount. Cause usually it would be for like a week time frame or so. Right. Um, and you should, I mean, regularly check your pages do you need to update your description? Look at your metadata. You definitely, uh, publishing a book and putting it up there, it's not a set it and forget it type thing for sure. Um, you've got your author, Amazon Author Central to be looking at, you know, they change things all the time. And so oh. you definitely have to stay on top of it and figure out, it gets harder. Like I have 16 books, so that gets to that is amazing. I, I am in awe of the fact that you could birth that many books, my friend. A lot. And, you know, some of them have been in this head for years and years and years, like literally the book. So right above my shoulder, that one, my latest mm -hmm. fiction book, I was probably thinking about that book 10 years ago. Really? So they, they sit in there, um, Becca Syme, she's a productivity coach for writers. She uses the Gallup strength and she calls that bread machine writers. Like it just needs to sit mm -hmm. and knead and develop and bake and that is like my process i call it the compost pile because i think it's like you throw in all these different scraps and then over time it converts into something different um yep. so anyway well that happens long. over here on and for me in the nonfiction world too i think yes. i have like three manuscripts that are in the works and i will like start it and i'll get really passionate about it and then i stop and I'm like, oh, well, obviously I've not experienced something that I need to connect the dots. Yes. And, um, and I, you know, I know you and I are both um, Christian women, so I can share this with you and share it with our, with our reader or our watchers today, our attendees. Um, but I also am a believer in like kind of some divine inspiration. So yes. I, when, when, when God's ready for me to write, I write. Yes, it happens like that. when it's supposed to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you feel it, Jen, like I'm, I have to tell yes. people, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. I got to get it out. Um, book number two, I wrote in an entire day because of that, mm -hmm. like literally. Yeah. So I um, have become very, um, very accustomed to that. And so when writer's block happens, it's no fun. And then I call you and you help me. Um, That's right. <laughs> So back to, right. So back to the pricing, um, I would say, you know, definitely be thinking about what your competition, what your competition yeah. is doing. I find that many people, it's easy for them to purchase a book under 20 bucks. Like that is a yeah. pretty common thing. Yeah. Um, usually on the ebook and I'd love your thoughts, Jen, but on the ebook, it's usually about $10 cheaper. That's what yeah. kind of my rule of thumb mm -hmm. has been. Um, and if you do that, it allows you to give yourself, if you're a self-published author, or if you want to do some marketing with your publishing company, um, it allows you to get flexibility. If you want to do like Kindle countdowns, if you're exclusive to KDP or yes. you want to do some additional reasons, right. right? Yes. And, and that value, you know, when you go to the product page, it shows the Kindle and the paperback and their prices side by side. So for yep. a lot of people, they will see, oh my gosh, the Kindle's like $10 cheaper. Mm -hmm. that's a no-brainer right that feels like a deal and yeah. so I always tell people put out both put out the print and the paper and the ebook 
even if all you're thinking you're going to sell is ebook, because that compare price comparison right there is going to yeah. get a lot of people feeling like they're getting a bargain. And so it's definitely, yeah. again, it's that psychology of pricing. It's definitely worthwhile having it. And obviously that's a starting point because you want to see what your competition is doing, mm -hmm. what kind of book you're putting out, all those different, there's all those variables that go into it. Um, but I think you mentioned something really interesting, which is the Kindle countdown. Um, and yeah. I think it's great to, to talk a little bit about pricing for launches and like sales. And what is your thoughts? This is your Ballywick. I would love to hear your thoughts about how you like to price for launches and for special promotions. You might not like my answer, but I'm going to tell you it to you. <laughs> I do not believe in doing paperback discounts uh, online. I just don't. No, I and don't. I actually would not encourage you to do a, do a lower price at a launch for paperback because it's easier to go down later than it is to go up. So yes. I would encourage you when you're launching the paperback version for you to consider what is the, what, what price point are you comfortable with? And in the future, if people are not converting to purchasing, you can always go down, but I would not want you to go the other way unless things in your life have shifted. I've, I'm working with an author right now mm -hmm. who has become a global phenomenon and it makes sense for her book to be more expensive now. Absolutely. Right. The market Absolutely. will do that. Um, yeah. So paperback, I think, you know, stick with a good price you're comfortable with. You can change yeah. it. But I would recommend staying there. On the ebook, I see a lot of people do 99 cent ebooks during the pre-order. That helps mm -hmm. you really kind of pull yeah. in, go and get interest early on. Yeah. Most people who are book lovers and that are supporting you in the launch will likely want a hard copy too. Right? Like yes. You know, look, both of us, you can't see mine today, but we both have bookshelves. Like if I know right. the author, if I love the author, I want them in my bookshelf. I want shelf. the hard, yeah, yeah. Dude. Especially Dude. nonfiction. I rarely yeah. buy nonfiction as digital. It's just I not agree. as easy. I like to mark up my books and stuff and it's just not as easy to do that. Refer to it digitally. My to be read pile. I mean, I literally have a stack of books here and they're, I mean, they're all paperback. Now fiction, you know, fiction is more, can be more of an impulse buy. And Absolutely. so, especially, I, you know, I've subscribed to KU and, you know, it's very easy. You get to the end of the book and you just click the button for the next book in the series. Absolutely. That's very easy to do. You know, Absolutely. most fiction ebooks are $3.99, $4.99. Sometimes you see $5.99. I mean, that's a Starbucks cup of coffee, right? Exactly. So it, no it's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty easy impulse buy. And I rarely go back to fiction and reread it. Certainly. I just have way too many books, but with nonfiction, yes, I want to pull that out. I want to share it. I want to talk to somebody and, oh, what was that quote that person said that I highlighted? And so I think that is the difference, between, especially between nonfiction and fiction, that a lot more people are going to buy a paperback version of your nonfiction. Although I do sell quite a bit of paperback. There's a lot of people really do just like holding a book and like reading it, the experience, it's definitely a sensory experience when you're reading a book. Physically, an ebook, you just don't get quite the same thing. But the ebook right. is, you know, you can make the screen as big as you want. You can read in bed without disturbing anybody with the backlit screen. So, Great. you know, there's pros and cons to all of it. And some of this is knowing your target audience and what they're going to be looking for and what they yeah. want. I pull my readers, I try to pull them like once a year to see what they like oh, what? and what they're looking for. Like ask them. Just ask them, what do you Just want? Do you them. like do you like print books? Do you like eBooks? What are your favorites? Where do you buy your books? Are you in Kindle Unlimited? What are your favorite price points for books? What do you usually pay for a book? All those kinds of yeah. things because everybody's audience is gonna be a little bit different. And so you wanna give your audience, you know, within, obviously within reason, I mean, they would all love free books all the time, but <laughs> we have to make a living. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you deserve it. Cause it's a, it's right. your skill set that you're bringing to the table. There's something I did wanna share about if you do like a Kindle countdown, uh, yes. which could be a one day discount or a multiple day discount that right. counts down or counts up. Mm -hmm. My recommendation there is if you're going to do it, don't just do it and forget about it. Have it be a part right. of a, a Yes, a um, big campaign. Yes. Yeah. I mean, how are you talking about it on social? How are you engaging yeah. around it? Why are you doing it? 
Usually yes. it's a trigger that helps you maybe hit new category bestsellers on yeah. Amazon. There are also a lot of a lot of readers who will only buy free or discounted books. And it's true. That's okay. We know that about them and do some research, find the platforms that they get their information and make sure that when your book is discounted, that they know about it so they can promote yes. it to the people that you would never have reached otherwise. Otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Get on those promo sites. There's more of them for fiction than for nonfiction, but there are some for nonfiction too, but you there definitely are. want to make that part of a campaign don't yeah don't just randomly throw it up there and forget about it. you want to be telling people about it because you got to get your bang for your buck right um and that is one of the advantages of being in ku is you still make the higher uh royalty rate on a kindle countdown deal versus you just manually lowering your price yourself and they let you do it once a quarter for five so five days or they move it to seven now i can't remember uh, i think a, it's five I think it's yeah. five and you can do it once a quarter. So you can plan yeah. accordingly. Of course, you want the happy medium of you doing it regularly where it makes sense, but not too regularly where people go, oh, I'm just going to wait till she does her discount. Right. right? Exactly. You, you exactly. want people to know, but you yeah. also don't want people to only, only purchase the book then. Yes. I was actually pulling up really quick, Jen. I know in the, in the forthcoming months, we've done some planning on what our topics will be. Of course, yes. if, you, uh, if any Anyone listening would like us to touch touch base on any specific topics, let us know. But I was pulling it up really quick because we have a whole month in, yeah, a whole month in July, and we should probably uh, include, you know, KDP and some of these countdown stuff in there and share yes. a little bit more. But that's all about Amazon. How do you leverage um, yes. Amazon a little bit more effectively? I agree. Yeah, this is awesome. So many great, st so many great things. If anybody listening has any tips or things that you have been doing when you're selecting your pricing, share. I would love that. Yes. I would love to learn that. Yes. In, in the beginning, we mentioned a little bit about, and I'm pulling up my notes now. A little bit about a a how do you um, use your personal experience to build mm -hmm. upon for your book. And there's a book I'm reading right now. I stop me, Jen, if I've already talked about it. I don't think I have. Have I talked about Listen for Water on our on this? Episode? No, 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 no. You haven't. No. But I know yeah. you've read it too. We both yeah. of us have had the ability to be a part of the yeah. the team to help bring this to, to life. And oh my gosh, it's going. It's pre order right now. Uh, nice. It will be live the end of the month, May 31st. So. It is a fiction book, which actually, as you know, Jen, I don't tend to have the opportunity to work with a ton right. of fiction fiction authors on the regular. So I love Marie Beswick Arthur. Her book is beautiful. Her writing is beautiful. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful oh, book. It is. And I'm not completely finished yet. So yeah. there Ooh. you go. Not done yet, but I'm still loving it. And I know there's some surprise ending. There's a little surprise I know. I know. I know. That's what I love about it. But high level on the book it is about a, a very unconventional mother-daughter duo who find mm -hmm. themselves in a in the middle of nowhere in an unexpected way and they have to learn how to survive they have a really awkward and uncomfortable relationship and they are pushed yes. in a situation to to learn things about themselves and about one another and about their relationship through the journey in the book, or while they're in this situation, they uncover a a survival guide and they use it every day. I mean, they're living in like the wilderness. They use it yeah. every day to to get some inspiration. They don't even have, it's called Listen for Water. There's so many contextual reasons for it, but they don't yeah. even have quick access. It takes them several days to actually find water. But yeah. day two um, in this process and in them uncovering kind of uh, what this survival guide is, it says the, the goal for surviving day two, when you find yourself in an awkward and weird situation like this, is this <laughs> list five things for which you are grateful. And mm. Jen, I thought this would be a great that. challenge. Anyone that's listening to this now or in the future, I'm going to go in the comments when we're done and share five things I'm grateful for. Jen, I'd love for you to as well. Yes. Um, yes. But in a world of, of, of uncomfortable elements and craziness at times and things you can't control, I think it is good to pause and identify what are five things that are, you are grateful for. It's mm. a really good daily practice that, that her book is listen for water brings so much more to the table than even that one quote. But I just thought it right. was so relevant to share right now. I love now. that. I love that. That's fantastic.
Some parts of pricing are more permanent and unable to be easily adapted. For instance, your book page count, or if you choose to have a color interior or not, maybe the type of book you're producing, whether it's hardback, ebook, or paperback, that can dictate a minimum purchase price because you have to manufacture the book. But there are other parts of pricing that have a bit more flexibility. What will the market pay for? Take a peek at your competition for some insights there. Pricing your book is a marketing strategy and you should keep in mind your target audience while determining your pricing. My dad always tells the story. He is a used car salesman, a good one, mind you. And he talks a lot about how sometimes when he prices his used cars at a certain price point, he doesn't get any bites. And when he goes up a little bit more, weirdly enough, they, the bites don't stop coming. This is perceived value. And I do think if you price your book too low, there's this perceived lack of value. So we don't want you to go that route either. If you'd like some assistance in determining your pricing approach or how to price discount and leverage that as a marketing tactic, well, let's chat. Visit empowerprgroup.com slash marketing strategy session and learn more about our one hour strategy sessions that can help you get that information. It's a really great way to get focused and for us to get started. Listen, I have had so much fun empowering you. I know Jen has too. We really want to help you embark on making your author impact. So remember, empowered people empower people. We've empowered you and it's been so much fun. And now it is your turn to empower others. 